Now, Now, friends, friends, I'm I'm talking talking to you today about asking for God's blessings. Because Because I have have a problem with a lot of you. You You won't ask God to bless you. You don't do it. If you are a grandfather, and we've got a few grandfathers here, or a grandmother, and one of your grandchildren is doing something new, maybe they're learning a skill or doing some schoolwork or whatever, and then you say to them, if you have any needs, come and ask me for help. I'm happy to help you. Then you find out a month later, they failed the subject. And you say, why? They say, it was all too hard. I say, well, why didn't you come and talk to me? I told you, I'm here to help you. Why didn't you come and ask for my help? Oh, uh, I didn't want to bother you. I just thought, you know, I shouldn't. You would say, please, next time I say, I am here to help you, I am here to help you. Or what if your family are moving house or something and you say, once you're in the new house, I'll come across and help empty boxes and put things in all the right places. And they say, oh, thank you. But they don't call you. And then you find out a week later that they were collapsed in bed for two days after working through till five o'clock in the morning trying to get it done. How would you feel? You'd feel a little bit disrespected. You'd feel a bit unloved. Don't you trust me? I said I would help you. Why didn't you ask for my help? I didn't want to bother you. That's what some of you people are like. God says I will help you. Call on me. Thanks. And you never do. Just a little polite question. What is wrong with you people? Why can't you come to God and ask for his help? So I'm talking to you today about asking for God's blessings. Jesus said to his disciples before he went up to heaven, he said, until now, you've never asked for anything in my name. And he says, ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Don't you find it pretty good when the thing you need actually turns up? And you feel pretty good about that. Jesus saying, ask and you will receive. He also taught his disciples, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Now the people who study Bible languages, they say that those words, ask, seek and knock, are present tense continuous. It means ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking. So Jesus is strongly encouraging us not to be afraid to ask. Ask, seek and knock. Now last week we talked about Elijah and Elisha. Elijah was a prophet of God and Elisha was his assistant. And there came the day when Elijah was going to go up to heaven and Elisha knew that it was going to happen And he stuck very close to Elijah. And when Elijah said to him in the end, he said, what do you want? Why are you hanging around like a bad smell? He said, I want a double portion of your anointing, the power that's on you. And Elijah said to him, that's a pretty tough thing that you've asked for. But if you see me get taken up to heaven, you can have it. So Elisha stayed really close to Elijah. And we know that what happened was a flaming chariot of fire came and separated them and then Elijah was taken up to heaven and his cape, his mantle, fell to the ground and Elisha picked it up and went back to the river Jordan, slapped the water and the water opened up. He now had the power and authority that was on Elijah. What was significant about Elisha was he was greedy. He wanted something from God, and God was not angry with him. God did not rebuke him for that. He got what he wanted because he wanted it. He wanted this anointing, and he hung in there, and he got it. He became a greater prophet and did more things than Elijah ever did. He was not afraid to ask. He was pressing in and saying, this is what I want. And then in the New Testament, we have the case of a blind man called Bartimaeus. Jesus and his disciples were leaving the city of Jericho, a big crowd of people around them. 
and there was a blind man called Bartimaeus on the roadside with his bowl in front of him, begging for some consideration, money or food from people. He heard the noise and said, what's that? And they said, oh, it's Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth is coming through here. And so he began to shout and he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He couldn't tell where Jesus was. He just heard the noise of the crowd, but he was crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And you know what? The people around him said, be quiet. Don't you find sometimes when you say, I'm going to start pressing into God. I'm praying and I'm reading my Bible and, and I'm going to start going to church. People say, what do you want to do that for? They don't encourage you often. They even try and stop you. And they tried to stop him from shouting out. And so he just shouted all the louder. You know, you say, be quiet. No, I won't be quiet. I'm going to shout even louder. Hey, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stopped, heard him calling, and he said to someone, call that man over here. And suddenly the crowd changes. Oh, be happy. Jesus wants to talk to you. The same people that were saying, be quiet, are now saying, oh, come this way. So you know what he did? It says, throwing off his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. It's funny that they should mention throwing off his cloak. Why would you throw your cloak off when you were going to meet somebody? Well, the blind people in those days were given special garments so that people could tell by looking at them, oh, this person is blind. And here was a man who was wanting to be able to see and he wanted Jesus to give him back his sight and he was so confident it was going to happen, he no longer needed his blind man's cloak. He wasn't healed yet, but he threw that thing off and came to Jesus. Then we find out that Jesus said, well, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Rabbi, I want to see. And Jesus said, go. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus. He did not need that coat, that cloak ever again because he was now not a blind man anymore. He was not afraid to ask for the blessing. But you are. Some of you are. People will say, oh, why don't you pray about it? Well, 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 let me have a go at it myself first. Why don't you see what God wants? Well, look, look I think I can work it, work it out. If it doesn't work, then I'll, I'll, I'll get God's help. We push off the help. But Elisha said, I know what I want. I want that blessing. And Bartimaeus said, I know what I want. I want to be able to see. There's another great example way back in the life of Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham's grandson, Jacob. And Jacob was going back to his homeland, and he was afraid of his brother Esau that was coming off to meet him with 300 men. You think, why are you bringing 300 men to meet me? I think you're going to kill me. He was a little bit afraid, right? And in the evening, at right at night when he'd done everything else, he was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. We know the, the man was an angel, but the Bible says this man. And when the man could not overpower Jacob, he touched Jacob's hip, so that the hip dislocated as he was wrestling. And then the angel said to him, let me go, it's daybreak. And then Jacob said this, I will not let you go until you bless me. That's someone who wanted to be blessed and he, he was determined to ask for the blessing. So the angel said to him, your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, which means a prince with God, because you have struggled with God and with men and you have overcome. He was so determined to be blessed that the angel said, you can have that blessing. You're going to be blessed. He was not afraid to ask. Now, there's another example in the Bible that's quite obscure. It crops up in a list of names in the Bible, but his name was Jabez. And the Bible says, Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me wherever I go and protect me from harm so I won't feel any pain. And then it just simply says, God granted his request. 
ask and you shall receive. He asked and he received. God didn't say, who do you think you are? God didn't say, go to the end of the line, take a number. God didn't say, well, I want you to jump up and down and open three orphanages. He didn't make any, he just simply said, you can have what you asked for. So here's the example. Elisha got what he asked for. Blind Bartimaeus got what he asked for. Jacob got what he asked for. And Jabez got what he asked for. And none of them ever got in trouble for asking. But we seem to be a bit embarrassed about asking. Well, look at what Jesus said. Until now you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive. That your joy will be complete. Jesus saying to the disciples, come on, ask. Ask. Oh, I couldn't do that. I've already had so many blessings. No, 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 that wouldn't be right. Jesus is saying, I'm telling you to ask so that you'll receive. Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. This is what I'm asking you to do. Don't be afraid to ask. To help you ask, I need to reinforce to you that God actually loves you. Uh, I don't think he really loves me. I mean, you know, he, he think, you know my, my, my cousins, they, he would love them, but not me. I don't know why people do this. I think maybe the devil just gets into their head and tells them they're no good. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Are you in the world? God loves you. God loves the world. He loves you. He sent Jesus to die for you. God loves you. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones and big ones and fat ones and all the others to him belong, right? They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, but people don't seem to believe it. Oh, he couldn't love me. Oh, you should know, you know the mistakes I've made? You know the blunders I've made? No, please don't tell me. But God loves you anyway. And then we find in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, Paul said, God's love is showered into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. God is wanting you to know how much he loves you. That's why you can come to him and ask. That's why you can do that. And then in Romans 5, verse 8, it says, God demonstrates his love for us. And this is how he proves he loves you. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not while we were goody two-shoes going to church with their hair combed. He died for us when we stank, when we were evil, when we were selfish, when we were proud, when we were immoral, when we were violent, when we were aggressive, when we stole things off people, when we hated people. Jesus died for us to prove how much God loves you. I want you to hear this. God loves you. He will ultimately have to punish you if you reject him, but he doesn't want to do that. He wants you to receive. He wants you to ask. Ask for forgiveness. Ask for peace. Ask for truth. Ask for his guidance. Ask for his Holy Spirit. He wants you to ask. He has proven how much he loves you. I like this kind of reasoning that Paul gives when he wrote a letter to the people in Rome. He said, the one that did not hold back his son, that's God, he did not hold back Jesus, but he gave up Jesus for all of us, why do you also, along with him, graciously give us all things? It would be a bit like this. Someone comes along and says, I really like you. I'm going to give you the keys to my Tesla. And you, they give you the keys to the car. And then later on you say, oh, um, would you mind buying me a meat pie? Not going to buy you a pie. If he's going to give you his expensive car, why would he hold back a meat pie or, or anything else? And how he's saying here, God did not hold back the most precious thing that he had, his son, and he freely gave him up so you could be forgiven for your sins. So what is he going to hold back now? What is he going to hold back when he's given you his most precious things? He's going to graciously give us all things. But we need to ask. And you won't do it. Why don't you ask? Why can you not ask? Come to God and say, God, I ask you. I ask you for these things. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Now, is God angry when we, when we ask? Well, the Bible says 
Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Anyone who comes to God must do two things. You must believe that God exists and that he will reward those who seek him. So when you come and say, God, I ask for your mercy. I ask for your work in my life. That proves that you're putting faith in him. That makes him happy. He is pleased with that. He's not angry that you're coming to him and asking for something. Remember how Jabez called to the Lord and he said, I want you to bless me. I want you to give me more territory. Right now I'm, I'm in charge of the car washing division of the company. I'd like to become production manager. Give me more room. Enlarge my territory. And let your hand be with me so that everywhere I go, doors open up. Things work out well for me. And keep me from harm. And God granted his request. Many years ago, I was talking to an American man who had a big ministry. He had a big building with lots of people working for him. And he told the story about how he went up to one of the uh, desks. He would go around from time to time and meet all the employees. And he went into one area and he said to this young lady sitting at a desk, he says, I keep hearing wonderful reports about you. You're very efficient. Your work gets done. You get really good results. So I want to say congratulations and thank you. And she said to him, do you want to know how I do it? Well, yeah, I do. How can you do so many good things so well all the time? And she said, I pray the prayer that Jabez prayed. Every day, she said, I pray, God, like Jabez prayed, I ask you to bless me. And I ask you to give me more responsibility. And I ask that your hand be with me so that anything I have to sort out, any problem I have to fix, I've got your help helping me fix that problem and make sure nothing goes wrong. And she said, that's why my section of the organization works so well. So he went and sent a message to all the other people and said, you've got to do the same thing. <laughs> you've got to pray the prayer of Jabez. Ask, ask for God's help and God's blessing. It's to do with us making up our mind. We're going to seek God. You will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. I talked with a man this week who is a Bible translator and we were talking about seeking God and he said, do you know when I have to translate the word seek for the tribal people that I'm working with in the Bible, I found out that word actually really can also be translated as want. Now wanting is a kind of like a bad word in our language. When the child says, I want ice cream, you say, well, excuse me, you're not going to get it just because you want it. So we've given want a kind of a bad rap, right? But if you're going to seek God, God, I'm seeking you because my mother held a gun to my head. That's not the same as saying, God, I'm seeking you because I want you. I, I, I need you in my life. I, I, I want to know that you're real. I, I want to know that you hear my prayers. I want you to sort out this mess because I can't sort it out. Then we're wanting God and we seek him from that strong desire because we need him. We want him. We want all the benefits that he gives. And so God says, when you want me, you'll find me. When you want me, you'll find me because you'll search for me with all your heart. And then seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. One of the tragedies that old people like me observe is you see a young person is given an opportunity and they don't take it. Oh yeah, it'll be there next year. No, it may not be there next year. Oh, I'll get around to it. It may not be ready for you when you get around to it. Seek the Lord while he can be found. Call on him while he is near. Blind Bartimaeus had no way to go and find Jesus, but Jesus came past. Oh, son of David, have mercy on me. He called on the Lord while the Lord was close. An hour later, he could have cried all day long. Jesus wasn't there. So there's times for us to stop and say, God, I need to press into you now. The situation, the timing is now. I've got to seek you. I need your power and your love in my life. Ask and you'll receive and your joy will be complete. So I'm going to get you to ask. Just put your hands out as if you're going to receive something in your arms. And just say, Lord, I ask you to bless me. You reckon you could do that? Actually ask. Lord, I ask you to bless me. Let's do that all together. Lord, I ask you to bless me. 
You see, see Jabez said, said, bless me, Lord. And, and God, God said, said, okay. Jacob said, I want, want a blessing. blessing. He said, okay. So, so ask, Lord, Lord, I need your blessing. blessing. I'd, I'd like, like to suggest, suggest that every morning when you get up, you say, God, God I, need I need you to be with me today. Be with me today. Bless me today. I had a young lady that came to my church years ago. She was a high school girl, and she went off to a Christian music concert, and she gave her heart to Jesus, very excited, and she would read her Bible, and she came to church, a lovely young lady. And one day she came to me and caught up with me. I was at the, at the church, church just, just as the, the, the tram was coming and she got off the tram and said, hey, Pastor Chris came across and talked to me. She said, I discovered something interesting. Every morning I wake up and I say, God, please bless me today. And my day works out fine. And yesterday I had a really bad day. And at the end of the day I realized I hadn't asked God to be with me through the day. So today I did. It was a much better day today. Just make the habit of saying, God, I ask you to be with me. I ask you to bless me today. Now, this is the prayer that Jabez prayed. Lord, truly bless me. Expand my territory. Be with me all the time and protect me from evil. That's the prayer that young lady in America prayed that made her department and the, the ministry so successful. So why don't we pray that prayer? You might like to just put your hands out. We're going to pray this prayer. Lord, truly bless me. Expand my territory. Be with me all the time. Protect me from evil. That's the prayer of Jabez. Now, there are people in this church that would like to make sure this church gets blessed. They know that I'm leaving, and that's very sad. It really is. And it's just the way it's going to be, and people have to work through how that's going to be. But God is in control, and God loves this church. So, so we, we should be able to pray, pray Lord, bless this church, give, give us a wonderful future and hope. Let's do that together. Lord, bless this church, give us a wonderful future and a hope. Let's expect that that's exactly how God's going to do it. Praise God. Now, you've got family and loved ones, and amongst them you've got some people that are probably a bit stupid or a bit irresponsible or a bit thoughtless or got themselves into some kind of mess or other. And you, and you want, want to keep, keep them safe, safe. But, but you, you also, also want to make, make sure that they know God and know His love and His power. So, so this would be the prayer that I would pray. Lord, bless my family and loved ones, keep them safe, and bring them to know and love You. So let's do that together then. Lord, bless my family and loved ones, keep them safe, and bring them to know and love You. You see what you're doing now? You're asking. You're asking the thing that you often don't feel like you could or should do. Learning how to ask and ask and keep on asking. And of course, you can go to church all day long, all year long, all your life long, and hardly have any sense of God's touch. So the prayer would be, Lord, open my heart and my eyes to truly know you in all your wonder, power, love, and grace. That's a good prayer. Let's pray that one. Lord, open my heart and eyes to truly know you in all your wonder, power, love, and grace. That would be wonderful. I'm encouraging you that you become a people who ask and ask and not afraid to ask. A loving father, a loving grandfather doesn't want to say no. They want to see blessing. They might say no if the child said, can I have a rattlesnake? You'd probably say no. But in all good things, you would say, yes, why not? And here's this other one that's a beautiful prayer. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit and with power to work the works of God. Draw me closer and closer to you. Let's try that prayer. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit and with power to work the works of God. Draw me closer and closer to you. There are things that God can do that no one else can do. When Darwin was on his famous trip in the Beagle, from which he wrote that book about um, the species, origin of the species or whatever, back in the 1800s, he ended up going to a remote area off the bottom of um, South America. And when he met the people that were there, he said that these people are so backward that there is no hope for them ever actually becoming truly human. And he 
wrote them off. He said, they are unredeemable. Well, believe it or not, in the next few years after that, Christian missionaries went down there and it was very hazardous. Many of them died, but they went there to tell people about God's love, about the truth of God's word, and they went there and in the process of that situation, they led people to faith in Jesus. A Christian church was started and the culture began to change. And when Darwin heard about it, he said, this is, this is impossible. And he began then, for the rest of his life, to give money to, a, to the missionary society that had sent the missionaries there. Obviously, there is something stronger in this world than what man can do. So in your situations, you're going to face situations sometimes that will be really difficult. And there will be no way out. So think of the song that Nicole led us in earlier. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. There's no human road, but God can make a way right through the ocean. God can open up a way when no one else would be able to do it. So be ready to ask. Call upon the name of the Lord. He who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We live in a ridiculous world at the moment. We have tides of evil that seem to be rising and we find that things that were that were simple to solve 20 30 50 years ago are so much more complicated now people are almost being deliberately confused about right and wrong good and bad just the dumbest things are being done we caught up with someone this past week who shared with us how that his young daughter going to high school was convinced that she was a boy People supported the idea, and so uh, that when she turned 18 or 19, she had both of her breasts removed so that she would be able to become a man. Just tragic. And she can't fix that. She can't change that. She can't say, oh, I think I was wrong. Let's have them back. It doesn't happen like that. And would you believe doctors and, and teachers and Adults around her encouraged her in this direction and pushed away anyone that wanted to try and make her stop and rethink this. Her dad simply wanted to ask her to wait a number of years before she finalized the decision. No, no we can't have that conversation. And so she was moved through. And we, we see on YouTube and other places reports of people who desperately grieving. I wish, I, never, I wish someone could have told me the truth before I went down this road. It's irreversible. What a world we live in. When I was a boy, you never expected people to come to such things. That's just absurd. Doesn't make any sense. People who think they're a cat, and so they actually put kitty litter in the school toilets for them. How stupid can you get? But this is the world we live in. We need to be asking more than ever for God's help because the world is just getting crazier. We need to ask more, and we need to pray for other people. Lord, I hear, I hear my neighbors arguing. Lord, would you send your peace into their lives? I hear about this child in this school. Lord, deliver that child from this foolishness and evil. Pray and ask. Get good at asking, because God wants you to ask. And the most important thing, of course, is to ask for God's salvation, because Jesus is reaching out to all of us to give us something wonderful. And you know, the devil says, it's just religion. You don't want that. It's just religion. It's not religion. It's relationship with the living God as our Savior and our Father. The power and wonder of God working in our lives. That's amazing. There's no other way to get that. You can't get that from university or from money. Elon Musk can't sell it to you. It's not something you can get except by knowing Jesus. And so God is reaching out to us saying, ask for the most important thing. Ask that you can be right with me. Ask me to be your Lord and Savior. Ask me to forgive your sins. I can do all those things. I will do all those things. Ask me to rescue you. Ask me to give you a life worth living. Ask me to give you peace and blessing that you don't already have. And so the biggest question for us now is, what are you ready to ask God for? For you? Or are you going to go away and say, oh, I escaped that service, Whew. got out of there. I don't want to become religious. Nothing to do with being religious. It's to do with being alive, alive on the inside <laughs> in ways that nothing in this world can do for you. Something out of this world has to do that for you. 
And that's that's God and his love and his truth and his word and the sacrifice of Jesus. You were born and created in a world that's owned by God who is perfect and pure. And we are not. End of story. We are not perfect and pure. We are evil. This face. And therefore, there is now a barrier between us and God. And the only way to make that right was for the blood of a sinless man to be shed on the ground. A man had to be killed. His blood had to be spilled, not just a bullet through the head. His blood had to be spilled to pay for all of the things you did wrong. And Jesus did that 2,000 years ago. He came to earth. He lived sinlessly. And then they hung him on a cross, blood pouring out of his hands and his feet. And when they put a spear in his side, blood running down his face from the crown of thorns. When they put the spear in his side at the end of his life, after he was dead, out came blood and water. That means when the spleen was punctured, the last of the blood was coming out of Jesus. His blood was spilled to pay for your sins. So now, God who is holy and us who are horrible can actually reconnect because Jesus, by putting his blood upon us, makes us clean. And suddenly, we're now back in touch with the God of all eternity, the most powerful, wonderful person in all of foreverness, right? He's our Father. His spirit is within us. We're engaged with life in a, in a, a transformational way. And you can't get it any other way. This doesn't happen any other way. So the most important asking you can do is to say, Lord God, forgive me. I ask for Jesus to come into my heart. I ask that you would forgive my sins, that you would make me your child, that you would set me free from all of the stuff that binds me that I cannot beat. Ask and you will receive. By the asking, God comes in and begins to do things in you that are beyond anything you're ever going to experience any other way. I'm concerned for those of you who have spent your life being religious because you've said, well, I tried that. Didn't do anything for me. Well, of course not. Religion is not the same thing. Having Taylor Swift's photograph in your home is not relationship with Taylor Swift. It's just not. It doesn't matter how many times you bow down and you kiss her feet. It doesn't give you a relationship with Taylor Swift. You actually need to know her. And the same with God. Having Jesus' photo on the wall, having, having gone to church and having sung the hymns, having nodded your head and stood and sat and done all the things that people do, is not the same as relationship. And you've got to have that relationship by coming to God and saying, God, I'm now, I'm now talking to you. You and I are actually having a conversation. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins. I'm asking you to come into my life. I'm asking you to make me right with you. If you haven't done that, that's a must. You must do that. And so I'm going to invite you to pray that prayer with me now. If this is your first time, this is the step you are taking, I want you to make that your conversation with God. So let's bow and pray. Lord God, I come before you today and I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to invade my life. Forgive me for all of the stupid things I've done and all of my selfishness and pride and make me your child and bring me into your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Ask and you shall receive. I'd like you to get desperate for God and decide I'm going to keep asking until I get all the things I want. In the Bible we saw people who did that and God was never angry with them. He continued to give them what he had prepared for them. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray your blessing and your peace upon these people. I pray, Lord, that you would fill their heart, invade their heart, capture them, and do not let them go. And let them enjoy and discover the wonder of actually being related to you. Not just worshipping you in a building or reading about you in a book, but related to you as their heavenly Father. Lord, I pray your blessing on them and your transforming power. In Jesus' name, amen.